second time around, I didn't have to prove myself. I mean, everybody knew that I knew what I was doing. And with Tim, it was more like, you know, you know, you know what to do kind of thing. Um, you got it, you got it. The work is much more intense and engrossing than being in a rock band by tenfold. You know, when I was in a band, you know, you write songs, they're spontaneous, you have time off, you rehearse, you get them together, then you do an album. That's intense, 10 weeks of my life. When I'm composing for a film, it's an absolute total lockout. I'm not reading books, I'm not listening to music, I'm trying to like tap into some deep dark well that I have no idea how hard it's gonna be to find water. And especially in those days, to work from noon till two in the morning. And just to take breaks to you know, have some dinner and see my family for a few moments. Batman Returns was halfway for me between doing a film score and writing music for an opera because every scene felt like the curtains were opening up on a theatrical vignette and I'd play the music and the characters would do their stuff. Everything was very broad and then the curtains would close and the next scene begins. It has that feel to it and that's really fun, even more so than the first. second one, he really wanted it to be kind of operatic, so there was a lot of music. Um, it's almost wall-to-wall -wall music from, from the get-go. There was about 95 minutes of score, which is about double the average length of the film score, and almost every cue is broad and theatrical. So out of the 95 minutes, I would say 80 of those minutes are really big in some way or another, and not much coasting at all. Very often in film, you play your big scenes big and then you coast along and stay out of the way and come up for your next big scene. And this movie is like one big scene after the next. It was 20 minutes more score than Batman 1 and with two completely new characters to write for. That's what made it fun, I think. Uh, if it was just redoing the first score, I don't think I would have been interested. Thanks. I... Tim will just talk to me in a completely gut-level way. He'll just tell me his feelings about this character, his feelings about that character. We never talk specifically, it's gonna be this kind of music or that kind of music, because we've worked together so much, we know that that, it never ends up being what we think it's gonna be. <laughs> so there's no point in being specific that way. Unlike Batman 1, which really had only one primary theme for Batman, the Joker did a little bit, but not in a really broad sense. These three characters all have huge, independent, thematic pieces of material that follow them around, and they're all primary, none of them are secondary. The Penguin probably has the biggest chunk, even more than Batman, really, in terms of musically following him. It's just fun, dark, operatic, theatrical type of music. And uh, all of his gestures are very broad. And he's the one, more than anybody else, that I feel every time he's speaking that he's on a stage. <laughs> like, I could picture the proscenium and uh, the sets behind him, and he's just belting out his lines on the stage. So. Um, his music is more simple that way. It's sinister, but sinister for me is fun. And my favorite penguin scene is when he dies. I'm ready a moment, darling. Oh, and at first, a cool drink of ice water. I always love the image of the monster in a 
pathetic sense because that goes right back to day one with Frankenstein and all these uh, classic monsters. And yet there in the final moments, you're feeling sorry for this poor thing because he just is what he is. It goes right back to the 30s for me and I just loved it. Catwoman's character is both more complicated and more frisky. She's not really a villain, we feel for her. And the way she becomes the Catwoman is in a way that she's victimized. So her transformation into the Catwoman for me was almost like a metaphor of a for the loss of innocence. Uh, she becomes this thing because of circumstances which she can't control. And then there's a very kind of tragic, sad part to her theme, which I bring back four times in the film. And that kind of represents the life that she left behind and the part of her that she doesn't seem to have any comprehension where it came from. The so-called normal guys who always let you down. Sickos never scare me. At least they're committed. The Catwoman when she becomes the Catwoman is my favorite theme for her. It's my favorite part of it. It's scored almost like a silent movie in a way. She's essentially destroying her apartment and in the process this big piece of music is playing over it and not necessarily catching her action in a very scory way but playing more from inside her head. As we were working on it and he was showing it, I was, I was going, hmm, I don't know. But then after we recorded it, it's like, yeah, that's really great. This is the high screeching motif with the high strings harmonics it ended up being chilling to me. In this scene, Batman is going to get knocked off a roof. He lands, he's out of breath, and the Catwoman is going to toy with him a little bit. So I start out little bit of the Batman theme and then that will make its way into a bit of a little bit of the Catwoman's theme, a few notes and I'll see how they work together and in this little demo with synthesizers uh, I play against the screen and see how it all works. Batman is knocked down and she's gonna have her fun with him. So we keep it nice and slinky. And nice and smooth and smooth. And I see the mistletoe up above. She notices the mistletoe. Again, we bring back the high strings. That's her little thematic piece that keeps coming back over her. And She's going to give him a nice cat kiss. You're the second man who killed me this week. I love the way he licks his lips after she uh, <laughs> licks him. That's my favorite part of the scene. <laughs> Batman, of course. I tapped into the thematic pieces from the first movie. <laughs> I tried to make it so at least it's grounded. It is uh, the same character as the first movie. So when he's on screen, you hear his theme. And um, half a dozen times, I try to invoke that very closely to the first movie. It was nice being able to just bring that back very clearly in certain very defined and specific areas. The way I score action sequences is the way uh, Carl Stalling scored Warner Brothers cartoons, which is very cuey, catching lots of action, catching lots of moments and gestures and things. And it takes so much time. I mean, it's unbelievable that I'm working through it eight bars at a time, and I've written so much music, and I've spent a 12 hours on it, and I'll, I'll look at how much music I've written, and it's only 47 seconds. <laughs> I'll go home. Man, this is ridiculous. I 
I love doing these action scenes. Of course, this is kind of unique because one of the biggest action scenes has nothing but penguins marching. <laughs> and that was really fun. I like that. There was no uh, gunshots or uh, jet engines to compete with. There was nothing to think about. It was just like right there. It was just have fun with it. There was no stressful internal battling like on the first one and most films since then. It's been, I suppose, a constant learning experience. That 19 years and 50 films later, I still like feel like I'm just cracking the surface of. Now, probably another 20 years, I'll get good at it. Yeah.